Oh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my goal for today is to uh, demystify the GRE for you and help you, um, you know, improve your application to grad schools by having a great GRE score. Uh, so thank you for that introduction. Yes, this is me. Um, so the areas I'm concentrating now with uh, the Princeton Reviewer DAT GRE and MCAT CARS. I'm also uh, going to be teaching MCAT Psych Soch as, as well. Uh, but I've taught all the different test types. I'm just in this <laughs> the stage of my career. These are the ones that I'm focusing in on. Uh, so these are just some of the things that can uh, you know, be helpful for you in terms of your prep. Um, we can kind of go into some of those things later on at the end of the session if you have questions about that. Um, so this um, um, you know, session today is really going to focus in on three areas. So the first area is why you should take the GRE, right? which kind of seems like an obvious question, but we'll be talking about why if you're in college now, it does make sense to take the test at this moment in time. Uh, then we're also going to talk about what is on the GRE in terms of the content and the various formats of the questions. And then the final area we'll talk about are ways that you could improve your GRE score. Just a few strategies, uh, just so you can see what might be helpful for you. So let's talk about that first question, why you should take the GRE. Um, and, you know, it might seem kind of silly. You're thinking, well, why are we asking that question? Um, but the reason that you want to take the GRE is if you're considering going to grad school, uh, you know, at all, in any way, shape or uh, form, uh, you should take the test now while you're in college, right? So if you're in college, it does make sense to take the test when you are used to studying, test taking, uh, you're kind of in that academic zone. Uh, you'd be surprised once you graduate how quickly those skills deteriorate, right? Once you have the uh, you know world problems facing you each and every day, we just kind of fall out of the habits of how to study correctly, how to manage that time. And of course, uh, once you step away from school, you have other considerations that you have to think about that sort of uh, distract from your ability to prep properly. So if you're in school now, it does make sense to take the GRE. It's not testing you on anything that you are actually learning in college, right? It's not a test of uh, what you know from college. It's, as we'll see, it's more of a test of uh, certain other elements uh, that don't necessarily pertain to your GPA. So the kinds of programs that accept the GRE, and this is a list of uh, basically the main areas that students will uh, mention when they are registering for the GRE. Those are questions that they ask you, what is your major field going to be? And you can see that the GRE covers basically everything, right? If you're planning to go to med school, you would take the MCAT. If you're going to law school, you would take the LSAT. Uh, if you're going to business school, you would take the GMAT. Basically, everything else <laughs> applies to the GRE. Uh, and you'll notice that there is that category there of other fields, which means that it is a very general test, right? It's a, it's a general test for anyone who's planning to go to grad school. Having said that, how could this one test be applicable for an engineering major, humanities major, physical science major? right? It can't. Uh, it's really a test that just determines how well you take this particular test. And schools use it as a baseline measurement, right? How can they compare these students from all these different schools? Uh, this is one baseline measurement that they can use to measure that across the board. So the GRE obviously stands for the Graduate Record Examination. Uh, it's required by most graduate programs, not all, and that's something that we will be talking about. Um, um, and it's also accepted by a, a large number of business schools as well as law schools, uh, right? So basically what they're saying is that uh, the items that you're tested on in the GRE would be applicable for someone pursuing their MBA or their JD. Um, so let's just talk about some of the elements of your graduate school application. Um, and so when you're applying to grad school, most programs require these four categories, right? They like to see your college transcript with your GPA. Uh, they have a certain number of application essays that you have to complete. Uh, schools vary in the number of letters of recommendation. And then, of course, they want to see all of your activities, right? So sometimes they want to see that in a resume or a CV or a certain list, right? But it's kind of an agreement that this is what schools are focusing in on. And all of these things are hard to measure when you're comparing students. And let's not forget, when you're going to grad school, right, it's a very specific 
degree, right? Some programs may only have a handful of candidates in that program, right? So they're really making very fine distinctions among the applicants. And so they do like the GRE because, again, that is one measurement that's not subjective, right? Because it's hard to measure if someone gets a, an A in Psych 101 at one school, does that translate to an A in Psych 101 in another school? Whereas a GRE score, right, it's, it's a leveling device. And so they can really compare how students are doing on the GRE. So the great thing about the GRE is it is very easy to take at this time. Uh, you can literally take the test uh, seven days a week, <laughs> almost every day of the year. It's just not offered on major holidays. It is a computer-based test, however, so it's only offered at Prometric testing centers. Uh, but since the pandemic, uh, they, since 2020, they have also been offering it for students to take at home in a remote uh, proctored version. Um, that you're able to do also seven days a week, really any time of day, but you have to have 48 hours notice. And there are a bunch of other requirements with that. So uh, if you're taking the at-home version, uh, you can only use uh, you know, a laptop, a PC or desktop, you can use a Mac, but you cannot use like a tablet or a Chromebook. Uh, you must be in a room that has a door, uh, so you can't like be in a library or something like that. They have to be able to see the door at all times to make sure no one is entering or exiting. They have to see your table surface to make sure that you're not utilizing, you know, any other props to help you while taking the test. Um, so you, you know, you're not able to have any food or beverages during the test, just like the regular test. Um, so basically, the at-home version tests the same content, uh, the same strategies for the same price that you would be taking it at a Prometric testing center. Currently, the cost of the test is $220. Uh, the other main difference between the two is in terms of your uh, ability to take down notes. So if you're taking it at a Prometric testing center, they provide you with six sheets of scratch paper and two pencils where you would be doing all your calculations um, or taking notes. At home, you have to either use an erasable whiteboard or you have to have a plastic uh, you know, sheath and have a piece of paper in it and then use a fine tip marker on the outside of that. Um, it's kind of a weird, it's a weird thing. They just want to make sure you're not taking anything uh, from the test that would be a security issue, which is kind of strange, I know. Uh, so as I said earlier, the best time to take the GRE is right now because it is so easy to take. You don't need to have, you know, two months notice for the test. Like if you know friends who are taking the MCAT, they have to register so far in advance. Uh, basically, if there's an opening at a test center or you have 48 hours if you're taking it at home, you can take the test. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can just take it as many times as you want. Uh, there are some restrictions with that. You can only take the test five times in a 12-month rolling period. Uh, you can take it once every 21 days, right? So let's say that you take the test August 1st, you're not happy with your scores, you could turn around and take the, get the test again on August 22nd. Uh, your scores are good for five years, which is another great thing. So let's say you're not planning to go directly to grad school, uh, you could still take the test now when you are in that test taking mode and then, uh, you know, save your scores and use them in that five month, uh, five year period. Um, one caveat there, though, is not all programs will accept scores that are five years old. So that's something you would want to check. Um, our biggest piece of advice is always do your research for the programs that you're planning to apply to uh, and find out what the requirements are of that. So a lot of programs, once the scores are three or four years old, they'll ask you to take the test again. Uh, one other nice feature about the GRE is they do have score select. Uh, so basically what that means is on the day that you take the test, once you're finished, it will ask you if you want to see your scores. If you say yes, you see your scores. And if you don't like your scores, you can decide not to send them anywhere. So on the day of the test, you can send your scores to four schools for free. You can decide to send just that day's scores or all your prior test scores, or you can decide not to send them anywhere, right? So that could take the pressure off. Let's say you don't do well on that day. You just say, all right, well, I'm not sending them anywhere. After test day for a fee of $35 per school, you can send uh, all your scores, just your most recent scores, or you can pick a particular test date that you want to send. So there is a lot of flexibility uh, in how you can uh, send your scores to various programs. Uh, so let's talk about what is on the GRE. 
Um, and I think sometimes students are a little bit surprised uh, at how difficult the GRE can be. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, students will say, well, it's not testing anything that I've done in college and I've got a great GPA. Um, so, you know, this test should be a breeze. Um, and those students are generally very surprised to find that they don't do as well on the GRE as they thought, because it is a completely different test from what you're taking in college, right? In college, your exams are basically limited subject matter, right? So professors are generally testing you on, at most if it's a final exam, right, one semester of material. Uh, and it's based upon that content from that particular semester. They generally allow you plenty of time to complete the test. And often because it's graded by an actual human, they will give you partial credit or maybe extra credit, especially, you know, it's not just the test that determines your overall grade, right? You also have papers, sometimes presentations, uh, some professors count in attendance, right? So all of those things can add to your actual uh, end of term uh, grade. Not the same for the GRE. Right. The GRE has a wide range of material that's tested in terms of vocabulary, in terms of the reading comp passages that you see, in terms of the math. Uh, a lot of it just involves memorization and strategy. The test is rigorously timed, right? And that's usually uh, most students' biggest complaint. They didn't have time to complete it. Uh, there is no partial credit, right? Either an answer is right or an answer is wrong. Uh, and it is machine graded, right? So there's no element for someone to say, well, they handed in this paper, so I'll give them some extra points, right? So there's no partial credit, there's no extra credit. And obviously the only thing that determines your, your score, your, your results is the score itself, right? There's nothing else going along with that. So for a lot of students, that is somewhat problematic. I think more than anything is the fact that it's rigorously timed. Most students have a little bit of difficulty uh, with that aspect of the GRE. So this is overall what the test looks like. Uh, and the order of the test is you'll always have that analytical writing assessment first. And then you'll have two quantitative sections and two verbal sections. It might not be that you have the two quantitative in a row and the two verbal in a row. That can vary. So you might have quantitative verbal, quantitative verbal, verbal quantitative. That part uh, varies. Uh, but notice the titles of those sections, right? Analytical writing assessment. Right? It doesn't just say essay. Uh, so you know that this is not going to be a simple essay that you're writing. That's 30 minutes, and that's a separate score. Uh, it's not called a math section, right? It's called quantitative reasoning, right? So you should expect that you're going to be reasoning to answer these questions. It's not going to be some simple calculations. And then, of course, verbal reasoning, the same thing, not just reading comprehension, uh, but questions that are going to require some reasoning ability. Notice that the test is only two hours, right? It was changed this past September, which is a great thing. Uh, it used to be a four hour test. Now it's a two hour test, so cut right in half. Um, but if you kind of notice the time, right? 12 math questions in 21 minutes, 15 math questions in 26 minutes. So on average for the math questions, right? You have less than two minutes. And for the verbal questions, you have about a minute and a half, right? So again, that time crunch. So not only are you answering questions accurately, you absolutely want to figure out, well, how can I answer these questions efficiently, right? You don't want to run out of time. Uh, so let's talk about each of these sections in detail. So like I said, you have the analytical writing assessment first, and that is a 30 minute essay. Uh, you get a separate score from that, as I uh, have indicated there on the right side of the screen from zero to six, right? So six is considered excellent, five is considered strong, uh, four is considered adequate, three is inadequate. Uh, most programs want at least a four, you can see that the average score is currently a 3.49. It has been going down, unfortunately, for the average test taker for the past five years. People are not able to write these essays well. Uh, and basically what the essay is, is a very generic prompt. Uh, and what the test uh, writers will say is no one is advantaged or disadvantaged based upon their major, right? So you can talk about anything that you want, but you simply need to take a side either for or against, and then you want to uh, supplement that with um, you know, compelling and persuasive examples that support your opinion, right? So there's no right or wrong answer. They're just really, it's kind of three things that they're evaluating you on, right? The quality of your thinking, 
uh, your ability to think about a subject from multiple viewpoints is what they mean by that. The quality of your organizing, right? Does your essay flow well, right? From one idea to the next. And then the quality of your writing. Do you adhere to the standards of written English? Uh, and so you're doing all of that in 30 minutes. Uh, it's a very basic uh, word processing uh, you know, system that you're using here to type your essay. Uh, you know, it's cut, paste, insert, delete, uh, but there's no spell check or grammar check. Um, and so they're looking for, they recognize that this is a rough draft, but they want to see the best rough draft that you can produce in 30 minutes. And again, that is uh, scored separately from the rest of the test. Then, as I said, you will have uh, two math sections. Uh, quantitative reasoning, and you'll get a score from 130 to 170. Uh, the average score is currently 157. That actually has been going up the last few years. Um, so what makes the quantitative section a little bit strange is just the format. So you'll have regular questions that are, you know, simple multiple choice. Uh, you'll also have questions that are select all that apply. Uh, and that's exactly what the name Im implies. So for those questions, you might have just one right answer. There may be two right answers, three right answers. There could be up to seven right answers. Uh, and you only get credit if you pick the exact number of correct answers. And then finally, the format is also numeric entry. So that's where you don't have answer choices. You just have uh, an entry box. So for those of you who may have taken uh, the SAT at one point or another, it's kind of like a grid in. So there are no answer choices. Uh, you have to come up with the answer. And that can sometimes be a little bit difficult for students because you don't have the answers to guide you, right? You have to know exactly what that is. Um, so the content, as you can see, uh, this doesn't go beyond um, really algebra two, right? It's high school math, arithmetic, algebra, geometry, and data interpretation. Uh, so no trigonometry, no calculus. Um, generally, the major issue for students is just remembering these topics, right? It's kind of some basic things. Um, and the weirdness of the test is that it will test familiar concepts in unfamiliar ways, right? So students will say, well, I know how to handle an average question, uh, but it's the way that the jury words the question. Uh, so they expect you to know that topic and then sort of turn it around and be able to deal with it from different angles. And that's the confusing part for most students. In terms of question types, you have your normal problem solving questions like word problems. Then you also have questions that for the math section are quantitative comparison. And that's exactly what it sounds. You're comparing two quantities, quantity A and quantity B. You're determining whether one quantity is greater than the other, whether they're equal or whether it can't be determined. And we'll do an example of that. Uh, then again, you have those numeric entry and then, of course, select all that apply. So kind of the weirdness of the questions sometimes school students, uh, they're just not used to these formats, these types of questions. Uh, then the verbal section. Oh, one other thing is uh, this is an example of the on screen calculator that you will be using. Uh, so that's another problem for a lot of students who are used to using uh, their scientific graphing calculators where they had the formulas already built into that. Uh, this is just a basic four function calculator. You'll notice that it does not do exponents. Um, but what the test writers will say is that this is not a test of long calculations, right? This is really a test of your math reasoning ability. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're not using the calculator as a crutch. Oftentimes it's much faster to, you know, be number savvy and, uh, you know, answer the questions without utilizing it. It's basically good for decimals, but uh, oftentimes students don't like working in fractions, so they'll turn all their fractions into decimals. Uh, and solve a problem that way. But if your answer choices are in fractions, that doesn't make, make sense to do that, right? So you want to really be good at some of those math skills that maybe you've kind of uh, deteriorated uh, since you're only relying upon uh, calculators and your computer. So I, I find that the calculator is just not that helpful. You're not using it that often. Um, and then the verbal section. So the verbal section, uh, half of your questions involve vocabulary. So they would be text completion and sentence equivalence questions. And then the other half involve reading comprehension. Uh, so the questions themselves, the reading comprehension um, generally will be one passage with usually like one paragraph. Uh, sometimes you can have um, 
multiple paragraphs, never really more than two or three. Um, the passages are run the gamut, right? They could involve natural science, social science, arts and humanities, current events. Um, they're all uh, at a level that would reflect graduate level reading passages. Um, the questions that are asked from the passage are multiple choice, but they are not just the simple sort of fetch questions that you might remember from other standardized tests. Uh, so they're questions that ask you to make inferences, ask you to strengthen the author's argument, weaken the author's argument, ask you about the structure of the passage. So a variety of topics within the questions. Uh, they are either multiple choice, for the verbal side, you also have select all that apply for the reading comprehension, but that only is up to three that would apply. And then you have this weird one, which is called select in passage. So basically the question will say, in which sentence in the passage, you know, did the author put forth his argument? You would find that sentence and then click on that. And then that becomes your answer, which again, something a little bit strange for students to adjust to. Again, and your score for this section is also 130 to 170. You'll notice that the average for the verbal section is much lower than the math section. It's only 151. Um, and that is generally because of most students struggle with the vocabulary aspect of it. Um, so one other thing to know about the test is uh, the GRE is a computer adaptive test. And basically what that means is it's adaptive by section. So your first math section, your first verbal section, uh, most of your questions will be of medium difficulty. If you do well on that section, then your second section will be mostly hard questions and your score range could go to the top, right? You could basically get a 170. If you do okay on that first section, meaning you get about half right, half wrong, your second section will be mostly medium questions, but then your score is capped, right? You really can't score uh, beyond like a 153 or 154. If you do poorly on that first section, uh, meaning that you get fewer than half the questions correct, then you'll get an easy second section and your score range will be capped even further. You probably wouldn't be able to score beyond a 150. Um, the difficulty with this is you're not really sure which second section that you've gotten, right? Because notice what each of those titles say, mostly hard, mostly medium, mostly easy, which means then there will be a mix of questions in that. Um, so a student who gets the mostly hard second section and does really poorly on it could still score less than a student who gets the most medium second section and scores really well on that. Because your score is based upon not only the number of questions that you answer correctly, but also the difficulty of those questions. So that computer adaptive nature of the test sometimes is a, an element that confuses students. All of our practice tests are based upon that computer adaptive element. Uh, so students will be able to see that as they complete their practice tests and they'll know whether or not uh, they got into the harder second section or the medium one and they'll see how that reflects in their score and learn to strategize um, for that. So let's talk about some ways that you can improve your scores um, on the GRE. <clears throat> Um, so letter of the day is something, so sometimes students will have to guess on questions and what you're going to see here are two different ways that students might have filled out their grid and sheets. Of course, you don't have these, right? It's a computer test, so you're not going to have these, uh, you know, written down bubbling like you hit with the SAT or the, uh, ACT. Uh, you'll notice that the student on the left went straight down the line, whereas the student on the right is kind of moving back and forth. Right, so let's think about which student is going to end up with the higher score, right? the one on the left or the one on the right. And hopefully you recognize that it's going to be the student on the left, right? Because by sticking to one letter of the day rather than saying, well, I've got two A's, maybe I need a B, should that, I can't have three C's in a row, right? You're wasting a lot of time when you're guessing. And of course, you don't want to be in a situation where you're guessing, but sometimes you recognize this question is taking way too long. I need to put an answer in because there is no guessing penalty on the GRE, right? So you don't want to leave any questions blank. Um, so it does make sense to stick to the same letter of the day. And if you do, you know, kind of statistically, you end up with a higher score because if, you know, there are four answer choices, well, each answer has a 25% chance of being correct. 
Um, so that's one thing to think about. Just stick to one letter of the day. You don't want to have too many guesses um, because that becomes another problem in terms of your scoring. Um, one other element in terms of letter of the day is thinking about process of elimination. Right, so if I ask this question to you without looking at your phone or your computer, you know, who was the 13th president of the United States? Um, I think many of us would be hard pressed to answer that question, right? An open-ended question where you have to generate the answer. That's pretty difficult to do, right? You might remember, well, I think Abraham Lincoln was the 16th. Who was three before that? Right? It's kind of difficult to know the answer to that. But if you're given four answer choices, it becomes much easier, right? And that's the key thing with process of elimination. I don't actually have to know the answer if I know what is not the answer, right? So I can eliminate wrong answers and see what I'm left with, right? So hopefully you know that it's not George Washington, he was the first president, and it's not Joe Biden, he's the current president, not Ronald Reagan, right? Maybe you remember that he was around in the 80s. So what are we left with? Good old Miller Fillmore, right? So he was our president from 1850 to 1853. Not a very long time. So really didn't stick in too many minds, good old Miller Fillmore. So process elimination is probably something that you're doing uh, unconsciously without thinking about it. Um, but it's one of those things to, if I don't know the answer, not panic. What, what do I know, right? So I know it's not this, I know it's not that. What am I left with? Let me compare those. And sometimes you can kind of back into the correct answer. Um, so this is an example of the text completion questions. So with text completion, you will have uh, one or more sentences with one or more blanks. So you have text completions that are one blank and there will be five answer choices for those. You can have text completions that there are two blanks and you'll have three answer choices for each blank. Or you can have text completion where there are three blanks and again, three answer choices for each blank. You have to get both blanks correct to get credit for the question, right? If you get one blank correct, that doesn't help. Um, the blanks work independently, right? So what you're answering for the first blank does not determine what your answer is for the second blank. Uh, the way to handle these questions is to read the sentence and look for clues in the sentence that tell you about the blank. Right, so it says the importance of lens manker Hans Lippershey, that's kind of an odd name, to astronomers, astronomers of his era was blank because his were the only lenses blank in Europe for decades. All right, so let's say you think that the second blank is easier to deal with, right? So if his were the only lenses, it sounds like made in Europe for decades, right? That's what it sounds like. So for the second blank, I need something that matches the word made, which eliminates theorized and inspected. And so therefore for that second blank, I'm selecting manufactured. So if he's the only one making those lenses in Europe for decades, right, then the importance of his lens makers to the astronomers is gonna be significant, right? For that first blank, I'm looking for something that would mean significant. That eliminates inconsequential, restricted, and my answer for that one would be considerable, right? So if you don't pick considerable and manufactured, no credit for the question. Um, so that's what you're doing. You're looking for clues that tell you about the blank, and then you have to obviously know the vocabulary in the answer choices to be able to make the right um, decision. This is an example of the sentence equivalence questions. So the sentence equivalence questions are one sentence with one blank, Notice that you're choosing from six answer choices. Um, so for these answer choices, notice that we don't have an oval, it's a square. And whenever you have a square as an answer choice, that means that there can be more than one answer. For sentence equivalence, you're always picking the two answer choices that give the sentence the same meaning, right? It's always two. Um, they are not necessarily synonyms. Right, so it says the blank nature of the commencement speech was an ordeal for the restless group of recent graduates. All right, so just like the text completion, you want to look for clues in the sentence. Right, so you want to say, you know, who or what is the blank talking about? What else do I know about that from the sentence? Right, so the blank is talking about the nature of the speech. What is the insight that we have? Well, it was an ordeal for the restless group of recent grads. Right, so if it's an ordeal for them, right, the speech must have been long-winded. Right? So come up with your own word for the blank and then match that to the answer choices. 
right? You might not know the definition of protracted, so just keep going, right? right? Concise does not mean long-winded, so you would ignore it, eliminate it. Uh, verbose would work, right? So we definitely would want to pick verbose. Uh, vigorous does not mean long-winded. Contrite means that, you know, you are repentant, so that's not it. Uh, premeditated means that you've done something ahead of time, so that's not going to be it. Yeah, so I think our... Uh, <laughs> So for this one, our um, things are a little bit off. It should be it's, it should be circling protracted. It's kind of doing that. Protracted and verbose, right? So protracted, you might have heard of protracted litigation. That's litigation that goes on and on. And verbose is someone who talks a lot, right? Kind of like me right now. So those would be the two answers. So if you didn't pick protracted and verbose, no credit for the question, right? You have to pick both correct answers. Uh, and once again, it's all about vocabulary. Uh, one thing in all of our courses, we do provide students with uh, what's called the hip parade, which is a list of the words that appear most often on the jury. Uh, so you would want to memorize those. Um, I think that's, you know, a lot of times students will complain about all that vocabulary. Um, that is one benefit of the jury that you can take away. Um, for most of you, you're not gonna be using the algebra or the geometry in your future careers, but having a good vocabulary, that obviously will benefit you down the road, right? Because when you meet someone who has a good vocabulary, what do you assume? You assume that they are well-educated, you assume that they're intelligent, right? We all want people to think we're well-educated and intelligent. So at, at least this part of the test, uh, this will have payoffs in other areas of your future career, which is sort of a nice thing. Um, all right, and so this is for the math section. So this is quantitative comparison, what I talked about earlier. So quantitative comparison, as I said, you have a quantity A and a quantity B, and you have four answer choices. So uh, the first answer choice is you think quantity A is always greater. The second answer choice, you think that quantity B is always greater. Uh, the third answer choice, you think that they are always equal. And then the fourth answer choice, the relationship can't be determined, right? Because sometimes A is greater, sometimes B is greater, sometimes they're equal. It depends. So notice that each quantities have a variable X. Um, so one thing that you want to do is whenever you have a variable, you want to plug in. And the first time that you plug in, always plug in an easy number, right, to make your calculations easy. So if we made X equal to 2, right, 2 is an easy number. Um, quantity A would be 7 squared, which is 49, plus 1 gives us 50. Whereas quantity B is 8 squared, right, which is 64 plus 1 gives us 65. So clearly, quantity B is greater, which means then we can eliminate uh, the first and third answer choice. Right? But you don't want to just jump in and pick quantity B as your answer, because the question is, is quantity B always greater? Right? Well, it depends upon what I make X. So since the first time when I plugged in, I made X a positive integer, right? I want to try something that's not a positive integer, right? So um, what if I made X zero, right? Zero is an integer, but it's neither positive nor negative, right? So that could change things up. So if I make X zero, then seven to the zero power is one and one plus one is two. And then for quantity B, eight to the zero power is also one and one plus one is two. And now the quantities are equal which means then quantity B is not always greater, and the answer is that it cannot be determined. All right, so quantitative comparison, it's notice, you know, it is comparison. You're not necessarily doing a lot of calculations, uh, but you do want to make sure that you're thinking about what are they testing me on, and is this situation always going to be the same, right? You always kind of have to think about, especially if there are variables, uh, what happens if the variable is... Uh, not an integer? What happens if it's a negative number? What happens if it's a really extreme number? And that can change how the problem is solved. This is an example of a geometry problem. It's in the numeric entry format. So notice you have that box there. You don't have an answer choice. Uh, so one box means that your answer would be either be an integer or a decimal. You, if the answer is supposed to be a fraction, they would give you two boxes, right? Um, so since we only have one box, we know that it's not going to be a fraction. Uh, geometry questions are a little bit difficult on the GRE because uh, the figures are not necessarily drawn to scale. Uh, I have to rely upon the information in the question to know exactly what I have, right? So I might not have 
this is showing sort of, it looks like it's equidistance between A, B, and C. That may not be the case, right? So you always want to read the question. So uh, when you read your question, you always want to think about, well, what do I know and what do I need? So it says in the figure above, the circle with center Q, so I can trust that that is a circle, has a circumference of 12 pi and is tangent to line AC at point B. If BC equals eight, then QC equals. All right, so a couple of things to think about. Uh, if Q has a circumference of 12 pi, right? Hopefully you remember your formula for circumference, right? Circumference is pi times the diameter, right? Which means then my diameter is 12. If you know that your diameter is twice the radius, we know our radius is six, right? So QB is my radius. If you remember anything about tangency, right? The point of tangency creates a right angle. So I have a right angle uh, for QBC, that becomes a right angle. Um, so I know that BC equals eight. And now I know, right, that QB is six because QB is my radius. And I can find QC if I do the Pythagorean theorem, right? So if I put those numbers in, right, think about it's Pythagorean triplet, six, eight, 10, right? So now I know that QC is 10 and I don't even have to use the Pythagorean theorem, right? And I just put 10 down there. So that's always what you want to think about with your math problems. You know, what do I know? What do I need? And then always check that you've answered exactly what the question is asking, right? The question is asking you about QC. You want to make sure that that's what you have uh, answered. Um, so just kind of one other thing I want to point out that I may have not mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of students will say, well, my program doesn't require the GRE, so I'm probably not going to take it. Um, you want to make sure that you do your research. Uh, there is nothing, you know, there's no consistency across the board in terms of which programs require the GRE and which don't. And lots of times students will say, oh, I'm just applying to this one program. It doesn't require it. I'm not going to take it. Uh, and then those same students find out as they're doing a little bit more research that they found this fantastic program uh, that does require the GRE and now they're scrambling to take it before the deadline, right? You don't wanna be in that situation uh, because some programs will say that they don't require it, but they will consider it if you do take it. Right. So that makes a huge difference, especially when there's a, a small number of applicants. If they have one applicant who hasn't taken it, one who has and did well on it, that can make all the difference uh, in terms of your acceptance. Uh, the other thing to think about is if you're thinking about financial aid or fellowships, oftentimes they require the GRE. So even though the school may not require the GRE, they do require it. Uh, for uh, those fellowships or for financial aid. So if that's a consideration, something else that you want to uh, think about. So in terms of the options for you, my number one recommendation is take a practice test and see how you're doing on that. For a lot of students, it's really hard to determine how well they're gonna do with the GRE until they take that first full length practice test, right? So if the programs that you're applying for, you know, require a 165 in math and verbal and you're scoring in the 160s, well, then you don't need a whole lot of help. But if they require 165 and you're scoring in the 150s, well then yeah, you probably need a little bit more time. And for most students to be fully ready for the GRE, it's generally two to three months of prep. Um, so you could do it in less, but it really has to be sort of intense prep and it's really hard to learn vocabulary in a very short period of time. So I would definitely say take a full length practice test uh, and plan to prep, right? Don't just decide, well, I'm going to take a cold and see how I do. You definitely want to uh, work with an instructor or with a tutor for that. Uh, so hopefully you found this uh, session helpful um, and you've learned some of the strategies that you will need for the GRE. Uh, now that we are towards the end of the session here, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask away um, and I can answer those. So it looks like in the Q&A tab, I see a couple of questions here. Uh, so one and and yeah, just the FYI Q and A tab across the top there. Um, yeah, how long does prac? Yeah, how 
basically how long to prep before attempting the test. Yeah, so I, I, I just mentioned that. I think for most students, it's two to three months, uh, some less, depending. It depends upon how long you've taken, how long it's been since you've had a math course. Uh, for some students, they haven't had math all through college, so they're kind of remembering some of these topics, like, you know, what is an integer? Um, so, but once you're kind of getting used to the math again, that goes pretty quickly. I think the big determinant for most students is uh, their vocabulary. So if you have a fairly decent vocabulary, uh, probably, you know, two months. If not, it probably is more like three months. Um, I see the question, what study materials would be most beneficial? You're using a book published in 2017. No, you want to get a current book because the test changed last September, right? So now the test is half the time that it used to be, which changes everything. So previously you had uh, two math sections, each with 20 questions, two verbal sections, each with 20 questions, and you had an unscored experimental section. That's no longer the case, right? So each of those math, the math questions now are basically cut in half. So you kind of have to strategize to move a little bit more quickly. Uh, the, the content is exactly the same. That hasn't changed. So that part of it would be okay. It's just a matter of uh, the strategies of getting the questions done in the time frame would be different. So it's slightly different approach than it used to be. So yeah, you would want to get a, a newer book. Um, you know, to help you prep with that. You definitely want to use prep that allows you that uh, compute, like all of our tests and drills are online. You want to get used to doing that rather than doing things in a book, right? Because that doesn't give you that experience of, uh, you know, testing in, the, in a computer format. Um, yeah, I mean, the question was, can we learn the GRE by ourselves with that? Obviously, anyone can do that without it. I think the what you want to figure out is what you need. So some students will say, you know, I'm fantastic in the math. I don't need any help with that. I just need help with the verbal. Uh, a student will probably benefit by having one on one instruction with a tutor. Uh, other students say, you know, I can't. I'm just not disciplined. They do better with a class, right, with the structure of a class. Uh, and having that discussion with uh, an instructor. Other people, I can do, you know, self prep online. And that's if they're disciplined, they can absolutely do that. Watch videos, watch recordings, that also works. You just have to know, you know, what you are like as a test taker, what works best for you. Um, the question is, what is the best way to improve vocabulary in a month? So uh, there are a bunch of things that you can do. So there's um, the uh, word guru, um, dictionary.com, they have daily words that they can send to you and you can kind of filter it so it sends you GRE words because the GRE uh, tests, you can, uh, you know, they kind of, they get lazy, the test writers get lazy <laughs> and they start recycling sort of the same words over and over. You kind of know which words show up. Um, they've gotten a little bit better. They used to have really arcane words. That has somewhat changed. Um, I think the trouble is uh, when English is not your first language, uh, sometimes you might have difficulty because they do test secondary and tertiary definitions. Uh, so you might only know the first definition of the word, not the second or third. So that becomes a problem. Um, but if you're practicing vocabulary um, every day, and basically we always say you want to learn about 10 words a day, um, you know, flashcards are a great way to do that. So you could do, you know, Quizlet. Um, and I always say, do it before you go to bed at night, right? Because the last thing that you learn is the first thing you remember. It kind of sinks in overnight. So do 10 words a day. Use the words. Try to make that part of your everyday vocabulary. Um, and on your flashcard, have the phonetic spelling, right? So that you know how to pronounce the word. Uh, have a sentence so that you know how to um, how it would be used in the sentence. Um, and keep quizzing yourself and kind of break it into three piles, right? So have the words that you're 100% sure that you know in and out, um, then have a pile for the words that you kind of know, but you're not 100% sure on, and then the words that you absolutely don't know. And you wanna work on that pile, right? And turn them into the words that you kind of know, and the words you kind of know, and the words that you know, and keep cycling through. Because sometimes students learn new words and the old words they forget. You want to make sure that you keep kind of going back to the words that you know to ensure that you haven't forgotten them. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're diligent with it, you know, it's really hard to say uh, how many words a person should know at this point. Um, but you, you can kind of have a judge if none of these words are making sense to you that you probably need a little bit more time with vocabulary. It's just not something that you can cram, uh, but a month probably would be okay. 
Um, there is no average score. The question is, is there an average score for vocabulary? Um, there really isn't, right? You know, if you have, um, if you go to a, take a child to a doctor, uh, when they're a year old, the doctor will say, well, they should have about 10 words. And about at 18 months, they'll say, well, they should have about 200 words. No one says you're 22, you should have, you know, 30,000 words. It's Vocabulary is very subjective. It depends upon, uh, you know, your college education. Obviously, if you've worked in the medical field, you'll have more medical terms, law field, more law terms. Only you know the words that you know and you don't know. Um, so I would say you can see, you know, there's we have um, lists of words that appear on the jury, as I said earlier. Kind of go through those lists, see if most of them are familiar to you. If not, then that's something you want to practice. Another good way is to focus in on word roots, right? Prefixes and suffixes, uh, because that can help you to define the word, even if you don't know it, right? So the prefix mal, M-A-L, means something bad, right? So you might not know the definition of the word maladroit, right? You might like, I don't know what that means. But the word mal, the prefix mal tells me it's something negative, right? Adroit means dexterous. So maladroit would be clumsy. So you can kind of back into it. Of course, that doesn't always work, but it is somewhat helpful. Um, yeah, so how to, the question is how to practice reading comprehension. Um, I would say uh, you just want to, um, a lot of times students will just read, you know, read things from the Wall Street Journal, from the New York Times, things that match the uh, complexity level of passages that you would see at the grad level. And you want to be able to break out claims, right, the author's claims, the arguments, and the evidence that they use to support that. So you really want to understand what is the author's position and what is the purpose in writing this, right? Is the author, uh, you know, trying to solve a dilemma, right? offering two different sides and takes a side, or is the author uh, disputing someone else's claim? Is the author just writing this to discuss or describe something? Right? You really want to understand the author's purpose and the structure of the passage, and that should help you. Um, the other thing is to um, remember that proof for the answers has to come from the passage. Um, so make sure that you're not selecting something that could be true, but is not necessarily true based upon the passage. Um, I think that I got most of the questions. Let me see if there's anything new. Yeah, so the question is, what if we are quite familiar with vocabulary but find it difficult to understand the questions? That, that's just practice. Um, I think that's especially true for the text completion questions and the sentence equivalents. Uh, lots of times students can get it down to three choices and then it becomes an issue of deciding between one or two words. Uh, you always want to think about the degree relationship in that sense. So, for instance, you have anger and you have rage, right? Rage is a higher degree of anger. So you wanna think about, well, if I have two words that are sort of like, you know, so you might have rage and you might have contempt, right? Those are very strong. Anger is lesser versus those two. So I would go with contempt and rage, right? So that's sometimes what you wanna think about. So you might have three words that all kind of mean the same thing, except one of them is a higher degree of the other. That might be the issue. Uh, the other thing that you want to think about, well, what is the part of speech? So sometimes you might be thinking about a noun definition, but the sentence requires the verb definition, right? So that's another way to approach it. Uh, the question is, what is the eligibility to get into Harvard? I'm not, it really depends upon, you know, <laughs> the program, what you're thinking about. Obviously, Harvard is a very highly competitive school, so I really can't answer that. I'd say it would be very hard. Um, how many questions can I mark wrong to score 160 in both quant and verbal? Um, you know, you, it really depends. Uh, the math section is, you can get very few questions wrong. So I would say three to four, um, you can get wrong to get a 160. Um, on the verbal side, you could probably still get a 160 with five wrong. Um, but it really depends upon where you get them. Again, it depends upon if you did really well in that first section and got into the harder second section. So that's just kind of a range. It just really depends upon where those scores were. Um, for Ivy League schools or highly competitive schools, and it, again, it depends upon your program. So for instance, if you are thinking of going for clinical psychology, 
you know, every clinical psych program is highly, highly competitive. Uh, you have to score beyond uh, most of them, you know, 163, 164. Um, if you're, you know, thinking that you're going for, you know, physical therapy, high 150s, it, it really, you know, physician's assistant, it depends upon the program. Some programs high 150s, others low 160s. Some programs will say things like, oh, you just need to get this you know, combined score of 320, right? Well, that's what you want to find out. So definitely do your research. Uh, not every program lists on its website what the requirements are. You should look to see what the average scores were for the prior accepted class. Uh, sometimes you have to email, sometimes you have to call uh, admissions. They don't necessarily always publish this on their website, like the prior scores, like they would for undergraduate programs. Uh, so you kind of really have to do a lot of research and find out uh, exactly what they're looking for. How important is your college GPA to get into a university? It's, uh, it's very important, right? So most schools, and it depends upon the program, most schools will sort of uh, filter based upon your GPA and your GRE score, right? So they kind of have a threshold because uh, they always get many more applications than they have spots. Um, so they'll have a threshold and they'll say, you know, GPA is below this, GRE score is below this, you just go in the no pile. Uh, everything else goes into the maybe pile. Uh, so again, you want to do your research, find out what the average GPA was for the prior year. GPA is important for most programs because it tells them what kind of student you are. Um, you know, if you have a high GPA, then they know that you are you know, going to work hard and you will probably continue to work hard in grad school. Um, but it also depends upon, you know, the uh, trajectory of your GPA, right? So if you started off with a low GPA first year, that's excusable, right? First year of college. Uh, but they look to see if it continued to ascend. Um, and so that would be different than a student who had a high GPA that went down. That's not a good thing. Um, but really what the programs are looking for is 100% commitment to their particular program, right? Because for grad school, um, you quit, they can't replace you, right? Because grad programs are so specialized. Uh, they want to make sure that they're going to get your tuition dollars for the entire length of the program. So if you quit in the second year, they really can't replace you. Uh, so that's what they're looking for, that you, you know, that you know for sure this is the program that you're meant to be in and that you're a good fit for that program. Um, so the question is, um, you know, I, my GRE score is a 302. Should I send it? Where I, I really depends upon what the program is. Um, like I said, you want to find out what the average uh, GRE scores were for that program, how good your GPA is, how good your letters of recommendation are, um, you know, all your extracurriculars, they will look at all of those pieces. So if, you're, if your GRE score is at the threshold, of course, they're going to look at the rest of the factors in your application. Um, but you want to do your research. And sometimes it's a matter of just calling and talking to people, right? So sometimes you can call and you just sort of get, you know, the administrative assistant. Other times you call and you get the assistant dean for the program and they're happy to talk to you. Uh, so it really is, you have to be your own advocate here. Um, and the research end of this is really important um, because especially for some of those highly selective programs, we're only taking a handful of people for a lot of them. Um, and so you also want to think about um, if they require an interview, which a lot of them do, especially the small ones. And you want to be 100 uh, percent prepared for that as well um, and have questions that you want to ask about the program and know about the program and who is in it. Um, so that's something else to think about. So yeah, it's hard for me to say like, you know, would that get you in? It really depends upon the program. I hate to keep giving that same answer, but it's so true because it's just so, um, you know, specific. So any other questions? I see. Them. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what other things should be included in an application that so it stands out? Um, so really the big thing that they're looking for in your application is your personal statement is gonna be huge, 
right? So your personal statement tells them the things that they don't know about you from the rest of your application, right? They're going to have your transcripts, so they're going to know exactly what courses you took. They're going to have your letters of recommendation, so they're going to know what other people thought. They're going to have your resume, right, the list of activities. They want to find out, well, who is the you behind all this? Um, and so in terms of that, it's really important for you to talk about why you are this great fit for the program, why this program is so important for you and why you are the great fit. So you're kind of selling yourself. That's really, so your personal statement really has to be uh, something that lets them know who you are as an applicant. So I would say that's really gonna be the big thing. Um, so, uh, you know, most students don't spend enough time on their personal statement. I would say that's something that you want plan to perfect over a month, right? Write a first draft, tweak it, change it, have others <laughs> write a second draft, a third draft, right? It's something that you want to keep revisiting. Um, so the question is, what do you prefer for a student writing the exam in two weeks, writing test alternative days? Yeah, I would say the big thing that you want to do is continue to take practice tests and then evaluate uh, your answer choices. So anything that you got wrong, you also always want to ask yourself, well, why did I get it wrong? Right? What was it? Did I misread the question? Did I misread the answer choices? Did I have a wrong calculation? And how do I get it right the next time? Right? What do you need to do to change that so you don't make the same mistake going forward? Um, so I'll, I think that's really it. You want to focus in on your weaknesses, right? Always notice that. And then any question that you weren't 100% sure on. So if it was just a guess, you always want to mark that down so that you can go back to it and say to yourself, well, why did I have to guess? Why didn't I know that? And even if you answer a question correctly, you also want to ask yourself, well, how long did it take me to answer that question? Was there a faster way? Right? You always, especially for the math, that's what you want to think about. Was there a faster way to have answered that question uh, and still get it correct? Um, I think I got all that. Um, for master's in computer science, obviously your math section is going to have to be really hard. I mean, I just want to say to you that, you know, the score go range goes up to 170. It's like a 168 puts you in the 90th percentile. I, you have to get almost a perfect score to be in the 90th percentile in the math section on the GRE. The reason for that is engineering students take the test all the time and they ruin the curve. There really is no curve for the math. So it's just ridiculous. Um, and they would probably look for, you know, your verbal side probably doesn't have to be as high, but probably definitely above average. But again, I don't know for sure what Princeton requires for that. So that's something you want to look into. Oh, so the computer adaptive nature of the slides. So unfortunately, I have to kind of click back to find it because my thing isn't. Um, I, I'm just going to talk about I'm not going to click back because that's going to take forever. Basically, what that means is, again, based upon how you do on that first math or verbal section determines which second section that you get. Um, so everybody gets a medium difficulty first math section, first verbal section. Um, and then if you get more than half the questions correct, you'll get that harder second section and your score range could go to the top. Uh, if you get about half right, half wrong, you'll get a medium second section and your score range is capped, right? You really can't score beyond like a 158 or 159. If you do poorly on that first section, meaning you get fewer than half right, You'll get the easy second section and your score range is capped even further. But then it also depends upon how you do on that second section, right? So again, your score is based upon the difficulty of the questions that you answer and the number of questions you answer correctly. So a student who answers, um, you know, all easy questions correct is obviously going to get a lower score than someone who answers mostly all difficult questions. Um, so you just have to kind of know and our test will show you which section you've got into for the second part of the test. Any other questions? Sorry, there is now construction <laughs> going on outside, so um, I'm not in my normal location, so I hope that's not disturbing anyone. Yeah, we can still hear you okay. And so I, I will uh, call out that in the in the chat tab uh, that Manya's team has uh, dropped some contact information for any you know remaining questions that you might have after this event so email and phone number there as well as a link to uh, leave your feedback for this event 
Uh, and it also, uh, they will have other events in this series for help in other ways to apply to U.S. grad schools. Uh, an event on GMAT prep, for example, uh, as well as other ways to help your application. Um, there's one last question about will they take interviews. I would say if the program uh, offers an interview, you should absolutely take it. Um, that can make all the difference when they meet you in person. Uh, you do want to treat the interview like an actual job interview, right? As I said earlier, you want to come prepared. So you want to absolutely know about the school, know about the program, and have questions prepared. Definitely do a mock interview with other people to work through it so that your answers will come across as being natural as well as your questions. Uh, but you should be able to uh, absolutely know everything that's on your resume, everything that's on your transcript, everything that's in your personal statement, right? So you should be able to elaborate on all of those things. And of course, you know, the question that they're going to ask you is why this program? And I know that seems like a simple question, but so many students can't answer that. They'll be like, well, because it's a really good program. Well, that's not enough, right? You really have to uh, demonstrate to them that you know what you're getting into, what the program's all about, um, what's going to be required of you, how this is going to help you. Uh, so it's more than just saying, I want to go to Harvard, right? You want to be able to say, well, why this specific program? Uh, but an interview can really make the difference, especially when you're kind of on the borderline for admissions. If they like you in the interview, you know, that can just definitely put you into the yes pile. Okay, so I think that's the last of the questions. Uh, hopefully you found this session uh, helpful. Um, if you have any additional questions for me specifically, feel, feel free to uh, email me. I think my contact information is somewhere. Um, and so I think that's it. Okay, so uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. My day is just starting. <laughs> I'm in San Diego right now, so it's early for me, but I know it's the end of the day for you, so enjoy the rest of your evening and maybe I will see some of you in another uh, session. Thank you so much. Thank you.